when I was uh, preparing for this, uh, this week, one of the things that um, really spoke to me was on the news. And um, we, we are looking, obviously, at a series of loving our neighbor or being good neighbors, um, because that's more where the, the neighbor aspect comes from, is actually being a neighbor rather than looking at neighbors. You know, so often we say, um, love your neighbor. We're actually... We, we should love our neighbor, but it's the aspect is, is that we are the good neighbor. We are like the good Samaritan being the neighbor. So it's about us learning how to be a good Samaritan, to be a good neighbor to those around us. And uh, this week on the, it's been, I didn't realize it as I was preparing for this message. I should have done this last week, actually, but there you go. Um, it is the National um, Week for Loneliness and awareness of loneliness around. And so it's been a lot in the news. Uh, for those that like the news, <laughs> there, are, there are some in my household that don't like the news, but there you go. Um, but, uh, but one of the things I, I realized was is they mentioned that a number of different organizations on uh, talking about loneliness, and one of them particularly was talking about suicide awareness because people being lonely so often commit suicide, but the biggest age range for committing suicide is men in middle age. So in other words, it's often men that have gone through, they've, they've gone through their youth, they've gone through their young adulthood, but then lose um, hope at that, at that stage in life. It is a crucial understanding. Now, they were also saying that it's becoming more prevalent in women and particularly in the younger age group. So it's not just middle-aged men, but, uh, but of course that related to my sermon of Father's Day. <laughs> um, but it speaks powerfully into it. And so <clears throat> we are looking at a number of aspects. We're looking at races reconciled. We're looking at uh, orphans embraced and the poor empowered through this, uh, through this series. And... Um, the grassroots suicide awareness uh, organization that was on uh, GB News uh, said that one in five consider suicide. And on Father's Day today, there are many, not just fathers, but there are many people who are lonely, people who are feeling suicidal, people who are desperate, people who are despondent, discouraged, uh, people that are really wanting just someone in their life that they know values them for who they are and uh, gives them that, uh, that in, increase. And Psalm 68 verses 5 to 6 says this, that God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. Families is God's idea. Yes, it's, uh, he, he's brings us, and that's, what he, that's why it's the importance of marriage, that's the importance of families, is because we are meant to be in a loving relationship. And when our parents love us, we understand how to love others as well. So unfortunately, uh, we are living in an age where families are broken. But connection matters. And that's why we're constantly harping on and encouraging people to be in a connect group because it's God's family. Uh, it supersedes the natural family because it is going to last for eternity. And it's important that we have spiritual connections, people who love us, uh, care for us, have our backs, that we want to do that because connection matters. God created us to be connected, to, to want to be together. In the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, Verse 1 says, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on to describe each aspect of what God creates. God created the light, and he saw that it was. God created the animals, and he saw that it was good. God created the stars, the plants, the fish, the birds. He created day and night, water and land. And every time he said... It is good. That's right. Then God said something wasn't good. 
I think that's quite a thing. After creating man, he found that there was no one to, for him to celebrate with, to cry with, to laugh with, and to share his life with. And then the Lord says this in verse 18 of chapter 2. He says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Verse 22 says, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, he exclaimed. <laughs> I like that version. At last, the man exclaimed, I have a companion in life. So God had made us. Verse 26 of chapter 1, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And so we were made, mankind was made in God's image, in God's likeness. And yet when he made man, he said, It's not good. That's quite profound, isn't it, to understand that God doesn't want us alone. That's not saying you have to be married. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you have to be in a relationship with somebody like that. What I'm saying is we are built for connection, for friendship, for loving one another. Because that's the important thing is when God said, let us make mankind, that us means that God lives in community. God is plural. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's perfect community. He birthed mankind and all of creation out of community. So community is at the very heart of God. So God didn't create mankind because he was lonely, because God already lived in perfect community. <coughs> yeah. So God wasn't lonely. And so he didn't create us because he was lonely. He created us because God is love. And love wants connection. It wants friendship. It wants relationship. It wants to be <coughs> a part of each other's life. The greatest commandment is love God and love your I don't know why it's my throat's a bit. Sorry about that. <clears throat> and so Acts 2.46 says this about the early church. The early church embraced this understanding of community, of being God's community. All through the Old Testament, the people of Israel were God's community. They lived in relationship. They weren't just trying to do God's mission. They weren't just trying to... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> don't know what started this off. But, um, but they want to do it. So verse 46. We have it up here, don't we? Yes, somebody get a microphone and do a bit of reading for me while I recover. Who's going to... Oh, hey. Here we go. Another Harris. Um, so we've got Acts 2, 46 to 47. It says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Verse 47, I think. <laughs> I was thinking there's 47 people. Um, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. <laughs> Would you like another verse, Rhys? <laughs> we can start at Genesis. We've got a way, a way to go. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. You keep that mic and then every time we have a okay. scripture, we can know okay. something okay. I can do that. <laughs> One of the things that we can see from this scripture is quite simply this, that they understood the concept of being together. They actually met together daily. We meet once a week, yeah? So it's important for us to understand that you can't meet too often. When you're meeting with the people of God, there's, there's a dynamic that happens there when we are together. God is there when two or three are gathered in his name. There is a dynamic of that God is present with us. God's community, the God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is with us when we're in community. Community is the very essence of what God is because you can't love if you're not in community. 
So they would always meet together. Now, of course, the early church understood that they needed each other. And they needed each other because they were living in persecution. They understood that they needed each other's prayers. When, when they, they, they didn't have a kind of a doctor's system like we had, they understood that when they were ill, they needed prayer. They needed to be together. They shared the miracles together. They cried together and they rejoiced together. I want to say to you, that's what our connect groups are there about, so that we can love together, we can share together, we can pray together. If you're going for an exam, your connect group should be the first on your radar. They should be praying with you, yes? If you're going for an interview, if you're going for whatever it might be, something's happening in your life, you're having a baby, your connect group should be part of it, not, oh, this life is different. It should be integrated. Your best friends should be part of your connect group, building a close-knit community, yes? And so it's important for us. And so the first century church understood that they desperately needed each other. Now, believers today still desperately need each other, but they just don't realize it. They just don't act on it, don't, re- don't appreciate it. That's the difference, is that it's not that we don't need it any longer, it's just that we don't understand that we need it. Yes? And I think that's important for us. So let me ask you a question. Who do you think battles the most with loneliness? You're probably going to immediately think it's old people uh, that, that, that are doing that, widows, people that have lost their spouse. But I want you to broaden your thinking today and realize that loneliness is actually prevalent here in this church, never mind uh, in, in, in the world. There are, so often we are lonely even though we, are in, uh, we have people around us. We can be in a crowd and still do it. And there's a new term that's been coined for it and it's called relational poverty. Now, we're we're familiar with the term financial poverty, but we're not always familiar with relational poverty, and we live in a world that actually we suffer more from relational poverty than we do from financial poverty. So you can be sat in this room today and be lonely, even though you are with other people. You could be a stay-at-home mom and be lonely. You can be a businessman and be lonely. You can be a college student who is surrounded by others in your class and still be lonely. You could be in a marriage and still be lonely. David often understood times of loneliness and he says this, he says, turn to me and be gracious to me for I am lonely and afflicted. So being lonely is not something that's, that we don't all experience at times, but we do need to be aware in our life of looking for people who are lonely and what we can do. Social experts say that the reasons, particularly in developed countries, for loneliness being so prevalent is, first of all, the breakdown of families, divorce, uh, co- you know, cohabitation, the increase of multiple partners, you know, the amount of times that... Um, that in family life that there's not, dad isn't at home or the biological dad isn't at home, there's somebody else at home. And so there's, there's this going on as a natural part of our culture. It's not how God designed it. And so that's why having that commitment in marriage is so important. The second reason that they give is increased mobility. So in other words, people don't stay in the same place for long. People disappear, don't they? Go all things. So whereas in generations past, um, people would have stayed in the same village or the same town or, you know, they would have been a lot more uh, connected locally. Where now, people can be, and as many of you are, many thousands of miles away from the rest of your family. And so that helps us so unfortunately to feel lonely. I remember, I don't know how old I was, um, but I remember I was certainly in my 20s, um, and, uh, and my mum and dad had lived in the, I'd been brought up in the house on Sandy Acres Crescent, 
Uh, I wasn't born there, but obviously for all my years, I remember that. And when I left home, they stayed there. And so, but it wasn't until quite a number of years later that they moved house and moved to a bungalow. For some reason, I was rocked. It was like, it was, it, was, it was something I couldn't explain and thought, why, I know where they are, I know where they've moved to, but it was like suddenly, the fact that they had moved from where they had been all my life suddenly made me feel insecure. And it's amazing how often we can get, feel insecure from some things and we think, well, I shouldn't just feel insecure from that moment. Dad was still there, I was still connected with them. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So it's important for us to understand there are times and seasons in our life where actually they, that, that moving away from parents, and for some of you that are going to university, it can be a lonely time. It can be a time when you're no longer in the parental house, but it's important for you to understand that. And I say that to parents, parents be aware of that, that as your children go to university or move on, uh, in, in any capacity, that, that you show them that emotional support and be aware of it, even if they're not aware of it. The third thing that they talk about is <clears throat> heavy workloads. We're all so busy. You know, ask somebody how you're doing. How are you doing? And they all go, I'm busy. Yes, busy, busy, busy. It's like the standard go-to phrase now. It's like, if you're not busy, there's something wrong with you. Yes. And so that's what we, we do. So we are busy and uh, in so many ways, but unfortunately that stops us from having some real, genuine, authentic relationships and connections with other people because we're just busy about our business, about our jobs, about our family, uh, you know, about our hobbies, whatever it might be, there's always something else. And fourthly, which might seem uh, odd, is the rise of social media. The rise of social media is what they term deferred loneliness now. Um, because social media, although you're connected to so many people uh, via text or message or whatever, this, the, actually you're, you're still feeling lonely. You've not got that physical connection. That's why when we went through the pandemic and we weren't with each other, and particularly for those that were isolated, it had a lot of mental, uh, uh, you know, causes because of that and really caused us a lot of, a lot of issues. And so even for, the, for others that were in families and you were kind of restricted to your families, uh, it was still difficult to go through that. We all suffered mass massively. And when we came out of that, we couldn't wait to meet together again and be together. And like being here today, you appreciate it so much more after we have been there. So <clears throat> it might seem strange, social media, because but we're only ever seeing a glimpse into somebody's life. We're not actually building close, authentic things. We feel lonely, and what do we do? Post a selfie and see how many people press like or comment about it. When Facebook first did this, they thought, wouldn't it be great for people to affirm other people by putting the like button? The problem was, is actually by doing the like button, so many people then were looking and think, particularly young people were looking and thinking, oh, I've only had 10 likes or nobody's like me, whatever. And it became a cause of suicide. It became a cause of massive issues among people because of the like button. Although it was good motives for it being implemented, it ended up having negative effects. And you may want to watch the documentary Social Dilemma. It is certainly very uh, eye-opening. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things I'll mention is that uh, Tristan Harris, I think I have a quote up there, of Tristan Harris, former design uh, ethicist at Google and co-founder of Center for Humane Technology, says this, we're training and conditioning a whole new generation of people that when we are uncomfortable or lonely or uncertain or afraid, we have a digital pacifier for ourselves. This is kind of atrophying our own ability to deal with that. <clears throat> and so we've, even though we're connecting on social media, we are still, uh, still not fully authentically uh, dealing with that. And so my issue is, as the church, <clears throat> We are the answer to the world. We are the ones who understand the power of community because we have entered into authentic, real, perfect community with God. So when, we, when I 
die to self and become and, and come in, in Christ, in Christ we enter perfect community. So I believe it's important that we do that. Let's just quickly pray. Father, I pray right now that you would help us to have eyes that are open to the people around us, Lord. There may be people that are in our social media world, people, Lord, that are, are maybe in distance from us. We pray, Lord Jesus, right now that you would give us eyes to see those who need a word of encouragement, who need a contact, who need a touch, who need a coffee, who need some aspect, Lord Jesus, in their life, that, Lord, that we would just be aware, uh, help us, Lord, to be a neighbor to them, to be someone who loves them with your love because you love us with that kind of love. I pray in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. <clears throat> so quickly, how do we love the lo lonely? Well, the first thing I feel is with physical touch. <clears throat> and this, I think, comes from Matthew 8 and verse 2 is particularly paramount. It says, there's a man with leprosy came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the leper doesn't ask a question. He makes a statement, does the leper. He said, Lord, if you are willing... He's not saying, he's not, not asking, could you, could you hear me? He's just saying, if you are, things. So left untreated, leprosy, particularly we don't have as much of it today, uh, although there are still cases, cases around, but, uh, but it was very prevalent in New Testament and Old Testament times. In fact, in Old Testament time, times, in the book of Leviticus, there's quite a lot of laws relating to how uh, to deal and the social stigma that ended up being attached with uh, lepers. <clears throat> but if, they, if it's left untreated, someone with leprosy would die within about 10 years. <clears throat> it starts with muscle fatigue and joint pain, moves on to scaly spots that start to develop, and the body gets covered with lumps filled with pus. The face changes shape, resembles lion, the growth on the vocal cords changes the voice. The body decomposes and it develops an extreme stench. And it's a very contagious disease. And when they went round, they would scream, unclean, unclean. They would tear their clothes and they obviously couldn't keep their hair. <clears throat> and no one touches them. This was the issue. No one touches them. But what does Jesus do? Verse 3, it says, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of the leprosy. <clears throat> now, we've got to understand, first of all, that Jesus didn't need to touch the leper to heal him. Because you'll see many, many times Jesus healed without ever touching. He just spoke the word and they were healed. But in this case, Jesus knew it was important to touch him, not for healing, but for him to say, I connect with you. He was showing love by doing what no one else was willing to do. He was willing to touch the leper. When he healed Lazarus out of the, out of the grave, he didn't touch Lazarus. He just called his name. Andrew was risen from the dead. So I believe more than anything that Jesus understood that this man needed healing, not just from leprosy, but from his isolation, from his loneliness, from his desperation, from his feeling rejected by society and by those around him. And that's the issue for many people live lives that maybe haven't got the physical leprosy, but feel like they've got leprosy because emotionally they're not connected and they don't have the relationships uh, with, with others. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but if I'd have been with that leper, I would have made sure I had lots of hand sanitizer. I would have probably kept my distance, you know. So what, what I'm saying is you've got to realize this, that Jesus in that day did something that others were not to do. And, and for, for, to a certain extent, for good reasons, because of obviously the contamination uh, from it. But we are wired by God for connection and for touch. Now, some of you 
are very touchy. In the right way, touchy, 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 feely, yes? And so you can talk, some people, some people, they love to hug, they love to kind of things. Now, Scripture talks about greeting each other with a holy kiss. Um, but so, so connection, touch is important. And so we need to understand that actually, some, for some people, it's the only time they'll get a hug is in church on a Sunday morning. And so we need to be that kind of church where people come and they know that we love them. And by touch, we can show our love, Yes. So we've got to do that. Now, don't hug too tight. You know, if you're going to shake somebody's hand, don't make it a floppy hand. And then don't make it too solid that you kind of, there's a competition as to who's the stronger uh, kind of thing. And we certainly don't want people to feel uncomfortable. We don't want to invade people's private, uh, you know, space. Uh, so we want people to do that. So some, there are some people that, uh, that you go to hug and you realize, mistake okay <laughs> they're feeling uncomfortable with that so so we've just got to be a bit wise about that yes and um, and 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 understand that but for some people the best thing you can do in their life is just to offer them some kind of touch i've heard stories of people that will go to the supermarket at the same time every week uh, because the same cashier's on because when that cashier gives them the change they touch their hand and there's, there's some kind of touch happening on that. We don't understand just how small gestures can make such a big difference. Secondly, we can love our neighbors by listening. Most people don't listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to answer. Always thinking, actually, as you're talking, they're thinking about what they want to say or how they're going to answer that, Yes. But people need to be loved by being listened to. It's one of the most valuable things we can do is listen to someone so that we can understand where they're at. They're at. Jesus was a great listener. Emmaus' disciples, Luke 24, is a great illustration of this. The two guys were walking along, and of course, as they're walking along, they're depressed, they're lonely, they de their hopes of eternity and of, uh, of a savior have been dashed because Jesus has just been crucified. And they hadn't heard that he had been raised from the dead. And Jesus comes alongside them and he asks them a question. He says, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, he already knew what they were discussing, but he says they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? Now, of course, Jesus could have straight away gone and gone, ah, oh, yeah, but I am Jesus, and, uh, and don't be depressed because I've got it all sorted. He could have straight away at that point, but he doesn't. He just continues to listen, and he asks a question which you and I would think, why is he asking something that he perfectly well knows the answer to? He says, what things? So have you not heard about things? What things? Why? Because he wants to hear their heart. He's interested in what they're thinking and what they're saying. He didn't try to just give a solution to the problem. And too often we are trying to solve uh, uh, some issues that are not there for us to solve. They're there for us to listen to. Guys, if you're married, <laughs> there are some things that I've learned that actually... Uh, it's only my early years of marriage. I wanted to solve the problems. Kath would offload and she'd say something and I would want to solve it. And then I realized actually, and then, I mean, one day Kath said, well, I don't want you to solve it. I just want you to listen. And now, now thankfully, she said it plain and ever since then I've... Okay. <laughs> you might need to ask Kath afterwards how well I'm doing on that one. <clears throat> but... And what I found is that when we're in a conversation, I find that if you're the one that does most of the talking, you think it's a good conversation. But if you're the one that's doing all the listening, you find that actually I don't think it was a very good conversation. So it's important for us to understand the importance of listening, yes? L listen and silent are made up of the same letters. Listen and silent, yes, exact same letters. Thirdly, we need to love with quality time. 
Jesus was always going somewhere. He was never rushed. He was either preaching or was healing or he was delivering someone. He was feeding the crowd. He was, but yet he was never so busy that he couldn't be interrupted. And I talked a bit about this last week, so I'm not going to go on about it. But yes, we can't impact everyone, but we can impact those who come into our life. We can impact this week somebody. And you and I, as the church of Jesus Christ, should be looking to see who can I impact today? Who can I be a neighbor to? Who is lonely this week that I can encourage, that I can, uh, I can give them some quality time, I can give them, um, you know, I can talk with them, and I can kind of listen to them, and I can just touch them in some way and show them the love of Christ. Yes? Ask that question this week. Who around me can I show some love or who can I give some time? Time is precious. You know, when we talk about being busy, so when somebody gives you the time, we value it, don't we? Yes? Um, and that's so important. Now, <clears throat> for many of you, maybe read uh, Gary Chapman's book, um, The Five Love Languages. Well, he had uh, a number of things. I'll just mention them to throw them out there. Love the Love is always freely given. You can't command and you can't demand love. And a helping hand is a loving hand. And God wants us to do that. Fifthly, he talks about loving the lonely with words of affirmation. Yes, the tongue has the power of life and death. Yes, so words of appreciation, compliments are powerful communicators of love to people. And so we need to be getting better at that all the time. And sixthly, he talks about loving the lonely with thoughtful gifts. Anthropologists around the world are intrigued by the cultural practices that go on in many cultures, particularly to do with marriage and the way that, that, that every culture um, that has been seen, that when they, in the marriage process, the giving and receiving of gifts is an important part of the process, it is in this culture. It is in in every culture that they have been that they have analysed. They've seen that because the giving of gifts is a fundamental expression of love that transcends culture. In other words, giving of gifts to whoever, whatever people's cultural background and education ability, but you know any kind of where they they're from, is the giving of gifts is a phenomenal love language of where of you showing love to someone, someone else, yes? And how do we know that? Because God so loved the world that he, what did he do? He gave, amen. So we need to be a people who give. It is a visual symbol of our love. So when, <clears throat> when we uh, give someone a gift, it is a visible reminder of that love, isn't it? So, for example, uh, particularly for you that are parents will understand that when your child comes um, and they bring a dandelion to you, now, you're not thinking weed. You're thinking how lovely that is because they're showing their love. They want to give. So right from early childhood, children love to give. And as, as adults, we need to realize we are still called to give. Give of ourselves, give of our time, give of our affirmation, give of ourselves because God wants us to do that. Loving the lonely is a choice that we make. Now, you might be here today and you're feeling lonely. I want to say to you that we care about you, we love you, and we want to help you, and we want to help you in your loneliness. And, but we want to remind you of Matthew 28, verse 20, where Jesus said, And surely I am with you to the end of the age. And Isaiah 41 and verse 10 says, Do, Don't you be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with the right hand of righteousness. 
let's make this week a week that we practice the sermon. Amen. Amen.